Welcome to the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. Welcome to the Prog Talks, an interview series by the Prog Space where we will be talking to musicians in all corners of the progressive music scene. Welcome back to the Prog Talks, everyone, with uh, me, Uncle Prog, once again. Uh, and um, before we start, I want to just mention that we now have this uh, link in the description where you can buy us a coffee if you like what we do. But also a subscription or a like goes a very long way. Well, with that out of the way, I want to introduce my guest for today. It's Adam Biggs of uh, Rivers of Nihil. I always want to say Nihil, but maybe it's Nile, right? Uh, we 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 say Nile, uh, yeah. but we could be wrong. <laughs> well, you you're you're the guy. It's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> I'm going to go with Nile then, because of course we are, we are, <laughs> we're the guys, but we're not. One of us, I think, took Latin in school, so we can't. We we're not authorities on that, but you know, well, well what we do, we we accept anytime anybody tries to say our name any possible way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna go with with River of Nile for this for this then, and uh, and um, you guys just finished up your uh, American tour, right? You 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 we're in new york on the 10th and that was the last date of this this uh the us part of the tour so how that did that go and and of course we're in the middle still in the middle sort of of a pandemic is, is was it challenging um uh yeah i mean it was it was challenging but uh you know not nearly as challenging as you know maybe some would have you believe or you know uh it it just it just seemed to be like i i you know aside from a few small things like it it's it's not unlike any other us tour i've ever ever done really it, it it's just you know there were some precautions here and there and and you know check your card type of thing but for the most part it felt like business as usual and um you know even even better than that, it felt like, you know, just getting back to into doing what what we do, you know, versus sitting around spinning our wheels or whatever. Well, I'm pretty sure the audience was happy to see you and, and the other bands out there after a sort of a long break of not being able to to go to live shows. Yeah, it, it felt that way. The reception was really warm and and uh yeah, like it it was uh it's an interesting time to come out of this pandemic and roll out new music for people all at once like uh there's, there's a lot lot going going into that emotionally for us and probably probably for the audience perspective is makes things you know strange playing new music in front of an audience in any circumstances is, is always kind of a, a head trip and it was just twice as much so because of you know uh yeah. all, all of all of everything we've been through yeah well, of course, you guys are are touring new music. You just released your your fourth full length album, right? The work uh, just a little while ago, and and we'll get back to that. But I, I want to sort of start a little bit earlier. On you guys have been around since I think two thousand and nine, right? Yeah. And and you released that that first album, uh, the Conscious Seed of Light, in two thousand thirteen, and. Before that, I think you had a couple of EPs out, right? So, can you tell me a little about about those early year, years? You know, up until you released your first album, how was that? Um, well, the early years uh, was like, whew, yeah. I mean, it, it's a. It's, sorry, I have to stretch my mind back a lot farther than I thought now because we've been at this for so long, and it it feels like only yesterday. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, we were just. A bunch of kids in in this scene who you know we thought we knew what was best mm. for the the metal scene around us because we had all been in other bands that had gotten to a certain point and and then like you know things didn't work out so originally the idea for rivers and isle was like to be an aggregate of like the best possible like metal and death metal musicians in our particular area, of mm. like Reading, Pennsylvania, 
and, and just see how far we could take it. Just being, you know, just, just put out the best stuff we can and, and just put our, like, you know, there wasn't any, like, there wasn't any talk of like, Oh, we have to, it has to be death metal and it has to be this many breakdowns and, and this and that. It was always just, uh, right. What we think is cool. Yeah. And, and, and it happened to be, you know, between the five of us, a lot of different stuff. Uh, so that was at the beginning, we kind of had this from the onset, had this, like, uh, this, this attitude of like, let's just, let's just do, let's just do whatever we want and whatever we think is cool and not be beholden to anybody else's ideas. Um, so those early EPs were just, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're kids making metal EPs that they thought were, you know, edgy and just like, we, it was just balls to the wall stuff. I still go back to those and listen to them every once in a while. And I, I still like think they were really cool. Like they're, they're, they're vastly different from each other. I, I feel like in a lot of ways and you know, there's, if they're not, they're not perfect and they're pretty juvenile, but I, I, I think they're fun, a fun time. Um, and, but yeah, we, that was just what we were doing. We were out there having fun playing as many shows as we possibly could mm. in any given end and, 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 uh, really just trying to, to get noticed so we could just do what we love all the time. Yeah, was yeah. was was there one point? You know, in two thousand and fifteen, you released Monarchy. That's that's when I first, you know, discovered you guys, and uh, and I've seen this album described as sort of a, like a masterclass of progressive tech death or whatever. And I, I wonder, was there at some point that you guys looked at each other and and were like, okay, this is getting serious, or this is actually, you know, going somewhere? Um, I mean. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, I, I guess if, um, I mean, there, there was lots of those moments, you know, like you get little hints along the way where you're just like, you know, if somebody you look up to, you look up to, like you brush shoulders with and they, you know, they say something nice about your band. Like that's a big moment when you're, when you're just starting out, you know? Um, so it was just a lot of little things, a lot of little, little moments that were just like, you know, the the first big one I remember was getting a, a MySpace message from Eric Rutan oh. <laughs> after we put out our first our first EP, and he was like, "You guys are awesome. What does it take? What would it take to get you guys down here to do a record?" Ah, and because we you worked just, with you know, him right on the first album. Yeah, yeah, we did end up, at, but you know, we did uh, our second EP before that, and you know, it just. And we stayed independent for a while. And like, you know, we just, he tried to shop us to labels. And I think we were just, you know, we just weren't ready yet. Mm. You know, we we're just too, too young. And we couldn't, we didn't have, we didn't have representation or anything like that. And uh, the situation was probably a little too big for us. But then, you know, after the second EP, then um, Metal Blade picked us up and, and we, you know, we talked to our old buddy Eric and he got us down there for that first yeah. record. Yeah. So, so how how do you view uh, when you think back at at Monarchy now, like sixty years later? How how do you view that album now? It's an interesting one. Uh, I love I love that record. It's one of my fa- It's my it is my favorite record to just sit down and like if I'm going to play bass, I just sit down and I play that one. I play I'll play that record start to finish because um, it's just so much fun as a bass player, and I think the songs are really a really good time uh it it's uh yeah that that record was an interesting one because if if you notice there it's like the the first time we had an actual member change um we we, and we you know we lost two founding members between the uh the release of conscious seat of light and monarchy and there was a lot of you know a lot was up in the air then because you know, we did Conscious Seed and it was kind of, it kind of was this big inexplicable hit thing. Like I, like, well, this band is kind of weird and they do like this old school death metal, but it's also kind of new school and it's raw and weird. And it, 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 and we got some big tours off of that and stuff. And then, then we went through the member switches, the lineup changes and, you know, it affected our process. It affected, you know, what, what the band is at its core and stuff. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the, the idea was to 
let people know when we put out monarchy that like that didn't matter mm. like that the rest of us we can we will make this thing work yeah however you know and we don't need we, i mean not that we don't need those people they were they were you know super huge early on and they're you know john coons is you know he's a monster riff writer he uh he started the band outer heaven and they're they're doing yeah. their own thing now so you know the proof is in the pudding like they you know they were good good dudes but it monarchy was an, an effort and you know it's that's why it's a, essentially why it's called monarchy it's supposed to sort of call back to our first ep which was called hierarchy yeah uh it's sort of just a, a, a like a fresh starting point for us mm. uh in a lot of ways and like you know we took a lot of chains off like there's there's a lot of uh stuff on that record that you know that the, the other founding members of the band that we lost probably would not have let happen. You know, and we did that on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, after, after that, of course, uh, the, the big one for you was in 2018 when where old, old know my name were sort of propelled to the forefront and, and of technical death metal. But you also gained a lot of fans from the progressive rock and progressive metal side of things. Can you tell me a little bit about the period after that album was released and what was the experience like of being, you know, when it blew up like that? Well, uh, yeah, so we put out Monarchy and it, it, you know, it kind of like, like Conscious Seed we put out and it was sort of immediately life changing. Yeah. Like we ended up touring on all these big tours and, and like touring with, legends like Whitechapel and like death to all and obituary and all these crazy names and then like monarchy was uh like the the cycle for that album was a little more uh a little a little smaller in scale and it seemed like uh maybe you know people behind the record just didn't know what to do with it anymore with us anymore like did like it felt like the the uh the word on the street was it's just like we were just some average band now mm. uh, and and nobody was all that interested in what we were doing at the time so that and and like to contrast like we felt like that you know we all loved monarchy and we yeah. thought we did so or we we thought we did a great job like and then but it seemed that uh you know a lot of people industry wise were just not impressed mm. and uh so we were like well i mean maybe we'll get a shot at doing one, one more of these things before the wheels fall off. Hmm. Uh, so that's where owls know my name, you know, uh, it, it, we, that was in a way we were preparing to say goodbye to the project and, uh, you know, just let, let sleeping dogs lie from there. Yeah. Uh, and so when it came to the, the, the point of like, Oh, should we add another a sixth saxophone solo? Like the it, it was just like, yeah, fuck it, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. I see. Yeah, uh, they're, they're like, what? Why not? Uh, what are they gonna, they gonna throw us in jail? Like, so that was kind of the was kind of the the thought process behind that one, and and you know, it just just so happened that I guess you know, turning off that that thing in your head that really cares what people are, you yeah, know, interested in, uh, tends to resonate sometimes and it kind of saved the band's life you know in a lot of ways yeah you know i I've, i i'm suddenly sort of um thinking that you guys had your little rush moment there you know like <laughs> when rush released caress of steel they were sort of at the label was sort of losing interest and everything and they were like well maybe we only have one more album to release so let's just go crazy with it and and it feels like you guys had a bit of that same feeling right this might be our last album at least for a big label or something so let's ju just do what we want right oh yeah yeah absolutely like at that point it's uh you know nobody nobody was sniffing around being like well what are you guys up to on this mm. next album like they it just seemed like nobody cared yeah uh so we just sat there and toiled away and just did exactly what we wanted no more no less mm. and um that's where owls know my name and it it just it just you know happened to scratch an itch for people at the time i suppose 
Yeah. yeah, and like I mentioned, it seemed to have found an, a new audience or an additional audience with prog metal fans as well. Did you get a feeling yeah. of that? Did you sort of get attention from other places where you hadn't? Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, just a little bit here and there of you know because it's I, I feel like uh, you, you're you're like the real hardcore like prog fans are you know they look down on things like hard harsh vocals and blast beats yeah. and things of that nature. And, and, you know, just as much as, you know, your hard line metal fans are going to hear a saxophone solo and turn it right off, you know? Yeah. Um, so there is, there is a little mesh, but I, I, you know, and, and like a little like interest in prog fans, but my, what my whole, whole thinking has been, and I, I've been, I've been a progressive rock fan as long as I can remember. So like, it's been like, you know, I feel like those two genres to me are in equal measure, the mm. things I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, and so, so like, I, I, I wasn't afraid to mesh these things together because in, in my mind, uh, in a lot of ways, the progressive rock scene, which apparently, you know, died in the seventies, mm. according to most, you know, well, popular. You, yeah. Music things, journalists. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you, if you wrote for, you know, if you wrote for Rolling Stone in the seventies, exactly. you want to yeah. see that thing dead as soon as possible, but it lived on in, in mostly from what I can gather the, the heavier genres of, of rock music. And, uh, you have a very healthy progressive scene you, that you can, can trace. You just kind of have to find it in a different spot. It, it wasn't on yeah. the radio, anymore. Exactly. but yeah, so that's, so these things are, to me, kind of inextricably intertwined mm -hmm. to begin with. So I, you know, I think one one hand washes the other yeah. to a degree. I think you're right in that. And, you know, when you go into some of those classic heavy metal bands, you will see that a lot of those musicians are, were big fans of the 70s prog as well. So so I think you, I think you. They're related, like you you said, but but let's move on to the new album. You know, I'm I'm eager to talk about the work. <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah. quite a massive listen. Uh, I feel like it demands a lot of the listener, um, and and at the same time, it sort of works best, in my opinion, as like a full experience. I, this album that I like to sit down and listen to as a whole, um, where sort of the songs uh, on their own are are great, but like the the sum total of it is more than the, <laughs> the the single songs, you know. Were you afraid that it would be too different or too challenging for 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 fans? Um, yes, but I uh, I feel like that makes that thought thinking, oh, this is too much for your mm. casual listener, is a uh, little snooty would be a little snooty of, of oh, me yeah. right yeah yeah I, I mean to to think that you know our audience couldn't understand what mm. we're doing or something um would you know i mean it is it is a battle like it's kind of like uh you know you want to be you want to be mysterious and am ambiguous enough but also you know you want to you want to communicate what you're doing clearly and and you don't want to you don't want the audience to feel like they're being pandered to uh it, it's just uh so i mean like we know it's a long a big long chunk listen but you know we i mean like some of my favorite records of all time the ones that have really stuck with me mm. for years and years are like just super demanding listens like dark side of the moon or quadrophenia or yeah. the wall or you know like that that's the, they demand your time and nobody really makes not i don't say nobody but uh there's not enough there's not a lot of that made anymore like the album is secondary to the single which i think is is fine in some respects but i you know, the art of the lp is something that i think you know should survive the digital age and uh you know i keep that in mind on the record for sure when, when we were writing it if you are enjoying this interview please head over to theprogspace.com for more reviews articles pictures and interviews all about progressive music 
You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Theprogspace.com Yeah, I, I, th- I think, you know, I, I read somewhere that Brody said that the amount of work that went into the new album uh, was, and I, I quote, obscene. <laughs> and he, he also talked about, uh, you know, something I found very interesting, namely uh, that you guys sort of entered a sound world while creating this album. Can you say anything about that? Brody's experience... Uh making any rivers of nile record and my experience making the record are very different even Mm -hmm. though we are working together uh my my world is less of sound and more of words yeah uh so and and making assigning meaning to the sounds that he makes is is often my job um but i i do understand what he means there's there's so much in these compositions that even like on a just a, on a cursory listen, listen, you're not going to hear half of it. I yeah. think like there's just there's even stuff that uh, I mean I'm in this band and and there's stuff that Brody will pull up and like hey do you hear this part on this track and I'm like what is this like there's just so much happening yeah so for him to be he kind of he kind of went off the deep end a little bit in this pandemic time and just did his uh, did his Brian Wilson thing and just was just making these compositions as big and lavish and and nasty as he possibly could uh and you know i didn't want to step in the way of of that whatsoever you know because i i thought even though these things are 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 really like disparate and advantageous and probably too lengthy uh i think what they were saying to me is that you know um the, the what the you know the songs were saying to me was that this is like it, it communicated that work idea mm. in in a way sometimes it takes time it takes patience and 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 focus and to get through anything um, yeah and so uh, you know you, if you, our art is a reflection of 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 life as we experience it then that's what we've come up with yeah, and and what you're what you're sort of talking about now is is something you know on the f- first listens of the album, one of the things that sort of hit me like a punch in the gut was the opening of the track "Clean." You know the lyrics and the way Jake delivers them. I want your money, your time. I want your patience, and your pride. Right? It feels very yes. desperate and and bleak. And I'm sure lots of people have been saying to you like over these interviews that. What's the concept of the album? <laughs> you know, but but the title of the album sort of explains itself, but I'm sure there's a broader philosophy behind it. You know, would you expand a little bit on, on that? Uh, um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you're not wrong. The concept is pretty much, um, it's pretty much wrapped up in the title. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, it's, it's, and it's really, like it's this is a thing born out of my experience like the the concept anyway is a thing that's born out of my experience uh over the past few years and like any other you know record should be i guess and and it's been a really up and down time like i put out a a record that changed my life like i moved uh cities and uh you know i stepped out of one really long term relationship and then I found it found another relationship and I'm married I'm expecting a child the, the, the pandemic just on the back burner of all of this and um so it was a it is a big tumultuous thing and and you know when you're going through this much stuff and and also you know you're you're feeling the economic weight of something like a pandemic yeah and the fact I, you know, we can't, we can't go out and do our jobs at all. You know, we can't do that. We have to, we, I became a landscaper, uh, which while I do enjoy that, that work, it's, it's, uh, not, not really what I think I'm here to do necessarily. Um, but it's just, I'm over explaining this, but it's, it's the work 
in general, it's my experience, but it's meant to appeal to everyone. Everyone has the work. Everybody has to work to make ends meet in some way. You have to give of yourself to find happiness mm. in life. Um, yeah, and, and that was what, yeah. uh, like initially when I thought about it and, and was looking at the lyrics and everything, it's like, it's being human, just being human is a, you know, is a, it's a, it's work. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so, so sort of, I think this album is something that I, I couldn't imagine uh, anyone not being able to relate to some parts of oh, what the, the philosophy or the theme behind this, this album is, right? Well, maybe, I, I, maybe a few billionaires out there or something. <laughs> Well, or children they, of billionaires, at well, least. <laughs> well, at least you know they also. They, yeah, well, uh, they. I guess they also relate to work or the absence of work, right? You know, I, I feel there like is the, yeah. There is that. I mean, there there are moments on the record that are just about um, blowing off work. Yeah, <laughs> one song in particular. Yeah, but um, there it's it's sort of. Like the the work concept was like a mantra that I, I kind of developed, uh, you know, a, as Owls was gaining steam and yeah. the the band became our full time thing. Like it, the band went from being simply you know our art and what we do t to entertain ourselves and just try to have fun yeah. to depending on it in a, in a lot of ways, and that's a scary transition to make and. Uh, um it, it 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 makes it makes you make weird decisions about your art is sometimes if uh if you're not careful and um so it 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 may like and then on top of all of that the pandemic just sort of swiping and swiping everything off the table uh just brought a lot of those feelings those struggle feelings to the forefront and that's uh how you end up with the work <laughs> Well, I think that's, you know, that has as well explained as you can with something as all encompassing as as this, right? Uh to go to go a little bit more, you know, into the the musical side of it again, you know, towards the end of a dreaming black clockwork, there's this like Ooh. dissonant riff that sort of reminded me of one of my favorite death metal bands, Morbid Angel. There's also like these electronic parts, almost industrial parts on the album and some solos on some of the tracks that are almost like, you know, AOR, <laughs> adult oriented rock. Give me a feeling of that, you know, it's it's so uh, different. So so then I want to ask what what is you what are your musical inspirations? You know, what is the yeah, what's all of this that goes into making such a, a you know, a kaleidoscope of, of sounds that you guys are putting together? Um, the short answer is just like, yeah, our entire lives, I guess. Because, um, yeah. you know, a, a lot of times you, when you get really wrapped up in, in, in the metal scene, per se, it's a little closed off. Like that's, yeah. it's like to a lot of people involved in that, it's like, that's the only thing that's relevant in music when in, in reality, like there's just so much more out there that's happening and like so much more that's happening to your life musically that you just don't take in. I, I thought a lot about like ambient influences from my childhood, like mm. stuff that my parents would listen to. And, and when I was younger, uh, all, like very good music, uh, but uh, things like that, or or just you know stuff that would would be on the radio or on TV when I was a kid. It just you know when you when you're just going going through life, you just have these sorry no uh, music. <laughs> you just have these musical moments, and and uh, they're all an influence. Yeah, you know. Everything from from you know the first time I heard uh, a Cannibal Corpse song to the fiftieth time I heard somebody singing Journey in a bar, you know, um, yeah. it's all part of your musical makeup. And I and I and I I feel like we were trying to stab at that kind of full complete thought in, in on this record more than just be a metal band. 
Yeah, I, I agree. So, and, and together with owls, I think all those, you know, influences from, you know, all kinds of places is even more visible, you know, for you guys. Uh, you know, a big part of that that sound of yours that you mentioned earlier, you know, let's put as many saxophone solos as we want on on, on this album, was, is, is the saxophone of sax straws, right? On the work, it's still yes. present, uh, but perhaps used to li- utilized a little differently. Uh, were yeah. you, were you sh- sure at the beginning that the saxophone would still be a part of your sound? or And how did you utilize this on, on, on the work? Um, yeah, we we figured that it would make its way into the record one way or another. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you that we were like just chomping at the bit, just like we need to give everybody more saxophone. Yeah. We, you know, we did kind of like yeah, I don't know, maybe like in retrospect, maybe we overdid it on owls, and we were just sort of wanted to step it back and like. You know, like this, we wanted to show maybe we have other things we can do. Mm. You know, the saxophone stuff is great, but there is, you know, we have we have more tricks up our sleeves than that. And and we also know that we can use that saxophone stuff in a way that's a little more textural, tasteful and and less shoehorned. Um, And it it also helped that while we were writing the album and the demoing process, there was just there was actually no saxophone present whatsoever. Ah. And we made, we made sure all of the songs were g- good enough on their own without yeah. them, without it before we ever introduced any to the, to the mix. And it just elevated the, the parts that it was a part of. And I think that's the best utilization for it. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting also that, that, you know, you got, quite a bit of attention for utilizing the saxophone on, on owls but uh and and i guess mostly from the metal press because when it comes to prog rock you know uh saxophone isn't really a very isn't the instrument that people raise their eyebrows you know you you have a lot of these older 70s band that used to like utilize that a lot and when listening to this new album i'm like i was like thinking is this like um a uh, death metal variant of Thundergraph Generator or something, you know, with those deep, very dark atmospheres, you know. So, so with prog rock, I don't think that's a very unusual instrument, right? Right, of course, and that's uh, that was sort of my my thought going into Owls as well. Is that uh, you know, there's there's like we we I don't know we're we're big we're big Floyd fans as as you know yes. anyone should be, uh, but you know like. You listen to Floyd and everybody will tell you for hours and hours, you know, like David Gilmour, great guitar solos, and they're absolutely correct. But there's also a lot of really good saxophone solos on oh, Pink yeah. Floyd songs and nobody even notices. No, and, and, uh, and I thought that that would be like an interesting dichotomy to play with, like to just, you know, maybe instead of adding twice as many, you know, like six extra guitar solos or something, we can just we can just use this saxophone like maybe maybe Floyd would have done. Mm. And and but in this context, there'll be something. Something that I guess shook up people more than I was expecting it to. But you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I think that's that's interesting. And at the same time, I, I love the use of saxophone on this new album. Like you say, uh, it's it's obvious that you took a somewhat of a different approach than on the last album, but it's it's very much, you know, adds an atmosphere to the, to the, this new album as well. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I've seen the work split the fan base a little bit. You know, I see some reviews and comments where people can't praise it enough and on the other hand some people are maybe a little bit disappointed with your move away from the more formulaic tech death sound or whatever of course you can never please everyone but is that something that worries you guys at all um worry worries that 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 they that we split them uh no i mean we we're expecting it um we know what we did on this record was going to push some people away. Um, and 
But we decided after Owls essentially that there is there is a hunger for us uh, for from our fans for us to experiment and to yeah. push things further. And and it seemed like that was what everybody really wanted at the end of the day was they wanted us to be free, which I appreciate. I like that a lot. So we took that as a sign to take this record just as far in any direction we felt necessary as possible. And um, we knew it would be, we knew it would hurt some, some feelings or, you know, if some people would not be along for the ride, but yeah. I think those people were, were going to fall off eventually anyway. Um, you know, that we're, you know, we, we just, we just want to do what we want to do. And, and, and I, anything, if we were just sitting there just writing more tech death, just because we know certain X and Y demographic that listens to us is only going to be receptive to that. That sounds like skullduggery to me. Yeah, that I agree. Like I agree. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, let's go back into sort of the creation or the, the, when you were working on this album, you know, you guys once again went to Atrium Audio when you recorded this uh this and like you've done so many times before uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you guys work together there and um yeah it's uh it's always a really good process we work with uh Carson Slovak and 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 Ray McFarland uh, in tandem in the studio they are both brilliant producers and engineers and uh, and uh we basically uh, but in the in the material that we've made with them, we kind of bring them more or less a finished product, mm. and and then we just we sort of they just put their spin on it. We get it packaged down, and and you know we put it put it together in the studio as a as a final product. Um, they you know it's just the the major thing there is that they're not they're not in there telling us no. You know, they're not in there telling us we shouldn't do this or that. They're always enhancing these ideas. They're going wild with us and yeah. they're laughing right along with every joke and, 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 you know, they're into every risk and, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes things go a little far and they push and they nudge back. And it's like, we have this good relationship where everybody, you know, respects the process. And we know that this is, is you know, the more free we are, the the better thing, the thing we can make. And that's a valuable thing to have in a produce producing, like in a record making situation, uh, because there's a lot of producers out there that will just not let you do yeah. what you want to do. Well, I guess, you know, that's, that's the, um, the, the joy of having someone that you know and that you've worked with over a long time, over several recordings and, and, uh, someone else that you have been, you know, working with over several albums is, is your cover artist. Of course, the legendary Dan Seagrave, which also made the, the, the cover, uh, for, for the work. Can you tell me about uh, what is it like working with him? What, what's that process like? Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I, well, first of all, it's, it's a, it's an honor to work with him. I mean, like it, it's, you know, he was always like, ever since I became a fan of, of death metal music, like they, his covers were always, you know, that's, that's the guy, oh, yeah. that's who you oh, go yeah. to for that, for that scene, for that feeling, you know, uh, that classic death metal feeling. Uh, so yeah, there was nobody else who we wanted uh and and so when it came time to make the first full length we you know we you know we had metal blade flex that muscle for us and get in contact with him and he was just and he, ever since the beginning he's been really into the ideas and like sort of challenge as like trying to somewhat challenge his own sort of style in a lot of ways because he you know a lot of a lot of what he does is very just like over the top oh, yeah. metal looking stuff and gore and, and and crazy stuff it's all awesome but that's not us like we're not a gore band we're not a we're you know we're not a you know we we have some intense subject matter from time to time but it, yeah. it's a uh, you know it it's more about beauty and, and emotion and so getting that lens through a guy like dan seagrave uh 
is is pretty much pitch perfect in my opinion um and and it's been great like he, he all i really do is i tell him you know i give him a, a pretty a brief synopsis of what we're going for on this record any particular record i you know give him a couple rough ideas of what i want to see so maybe some colors and then i give him lyrics and song titles and things and demos if we have them for him and then it's from there he'll send us some sketches we we go over a few things and it's usually pretty seamless after that like yeah. he, he usually just gets it he's he's a consummate pro <laughs> yeah i have to say you know i i love the album covers and uh i love the album cover of the last one you know dan c grave is you know I think I have a, you know, here as well, Edge of Sanity, the Spectral Sorrow, Sorrows, another one of his, you know, his creations. And uh, yes. so with with the album covers, you sort of went through some, it feels like you went through some seasons, right? The last album had some kind of autumn feel. The new one is very like wintery and, and you know, uh, so uh, if, if you if you went through four albums with four different seasons, where would the, where will the next album bring us then? Oh, that's uh, that's a good question, and uh, everybody seems to to want want to know that we're you know where where it goes next. And I, you know, I'm right on board with everyone else. I would love to know. Yeah, I mean, we have we have ideas, and we're in a very you know we're in a very early stage of 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 even contemplating of what course. what comes next. Yeah, you know, we're basking in in having put this record out, and you know, just getting our heads together around that still. It's still so much to do mm. with the work before the future is even, you know, a thing. But we have ideas, but well, several different ideas. Oh, yeah, it's so early. I could never, yeah. never even pretend to imagine what comes next. But it, 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 something will come next. <laughs> well, that I'm, I'm certain. I'm this time around <laughs> i'm not gonna push you any 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 more on that uh, because of course uh, what's important now is is the work and and in about one month on the 12th of november you guys will be starting your phases of death tour over here in europe right so uh yeah i i have some i have some bad news about that oh, really? unfortunately yes uh we uh, unfortunately will have to be postponing uh, the I phases see. of death tour until next year yeah it's just uh, things that you can imagine were, yeah. were issues. Yeah, they've, they've cropped up and, you know, it just has put put uh, a, us and a few of the other bands in situations where we're just not prepared now. And, and you know, we decided it would be better. We'll, we'll deli- be able to deliver a better product uh, next year. Yeah. In, in, you know, rather than rather than force this out of out of ourselves so that means that the, the the new plan is is hopefully to see rivers of nile touring europe sometime in 2022 right yeah i i if all goes according to plan we should be over there more than once i see. so yeah well yeah. i'm sure a lot of people will be disappointed that the the, the tour is the but then again i'm sure you guys are you know really you know sitting in the hot seat wanting to get over here so so i'm I'm sure that will happen as soon as possible right we just want to make sure the timing is right and and we can all have the most fun time possible exactly and and for it to be safe and to be you know yeah yeah well um i want to thank you so much for being on the prog talks with me and for exploring the work and you know the the background on the band you know um to you guys watching uh, and listening, uh, you should, of course, follow Rivers of Nile on their social media. You know, every link will be in the description. Uh, also, highly recommend you to check out the work uh, if you haven't already. Um, and uh, you can listen to it on streaming services or even better, head over to Metal Blade and, and buy the album, buy some merchandise, you know, get get the guys uh, rolling for uh, you know what's coming up next so uh, thank you um, Adam yes. for being on the show with me my pleasure thank you for those of you who enjoy what we're doing at the prog talks you know a like and a subscription helps us a lot also check out the buy us a coffee link in the description um, please uh, stay safe and keep spreading that prog love the Prog Talks, produced by the Prog Space.
Main host, Rune Belsvik Reynos. Produced by Rune Belsvik Reynos, Vanessa and Matthias Kirsch. All graphics and animations by Vanessa Kirsch. Intro theme by Giuseppe Negri. Outro theme by Zach Munoviz. This was the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. See you in a week.